We'd like to know what you are feeling, how you are reacting to that tragic bus crash in Saskatchewan. CBC's Heather Hiscox joins me from Humboldt for a live stream Q&A. By the way, you can submit your questions on CBC News, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Heather, you were at that vigil last night in Humboldt, an arena full of emotion, probably full of tears. Describe what you heard, saw, remember for me. Happy to, Suhanna. Thank you for having me as part of your program. I think if I can equivocate and say there are two main messages that I'm getting from the people here, and one simply is the enormity of this loss. And when you think about it, all of those lives snuffed out, 15 lives and 14 people, of course, with varying degrees of injuries, the enormity of that number, the suddenness of it, the horrific circumstances of that crash, and of course, just who those people are, the people who are the lifeblood of the community, the band of brothers, the pride and joy of Humboldt, Saskatchewan, because they are this proud hockey team and hockey means so much in this community. And if I can, where I am here in the Elgar Peterson Arena, just to speak to that question of the enormity, you see here, this is center ice and this was kept open during the memorial last night. But these flowers, people brought them by the armful. It was just an astounding sight and they put all of them around the logo at center ice. And so you just see how people came here to this arena more at the end of the ice as well wanting to pay tribute and wanting to be here and you're quite right there were hugs and tears it was a very emotional night at the vigil last night so that i think is is the one side the survival uh, the shock, the community reeling. But what I would also say is this incredible grace and already a community coming together. You see that in the messages that people have written. You see that in people bringing food. You see that in, I mean, in no question, in the kinds of things that people have been telling me about how much the messages from across this country mean to them. They are so thankful for the support. They don't feel alone in this. Yes, it's their personal tragedy and their community's tragedy, but they realize that it means so much to the people of the province and of the country that it's really buoying their spirits and it's helping them very much. The messages from not politicians, but strangers to the leaders of the community and to people in the community, their friends reaching out. So I would say, I, I would say it's that. It is, of course, the community community ripped apart and again it is the community being brought together by acts of kindness from even perfect strangers. Uh, Heather we're getting some questions from some of our viewers. John Spencer and Charlene Arnold uh, both pretty much have the same vein the same question. They want to know how the accident happened and if there is anyone at fault but that investigation continues. Do you have the latest from police? You know, Suhanna, it was a bit surprising to us yesterday that there was no RCMP briefing. The day before, certainly they said this is going to be a long investigation. And when you look at that crash site, you can see why. I mean, the force of that impact was just horrific and the, the crash scene, the load from the, the semi-tractor trailer all over the place and of course just the bus uh, in mangled wreckage so there was a long time spent there on the scene reconstruction specialists were brought in and they did do all of their work on the scene and uh, as of today that highway is open but that's just a part of the investigation think about all the things they have to do they will want to talk to the people who survived the crash and those interviews will only be possible when the boys and the team members and the team personnel are able to talk to police so there are interviews to do there are so many things to look at and that ranges from mechanical failure, that ranges from uh, human involvement, that looks to weather. It was a, a sunny, clear afternoon, so weather itself doesn't seem to be a problem, but was there sunshine impairment? There's the whole question of a line of trees potentially. Was that obscuring the view in some way? Certainly there are some regional municipal councillors who are saying we need to make these intersections safer, but that's not part of any official police statement to this point. So there are all factors that they have to look at. The driver of of the bus, as everyone knows, survived and incredibly was uninjured. And he was detained by police, released by police. Uh, there have been no charges. He was sent home with mental health um, assistance because imagine what he has lived through as well. But all of this to say, really, the only thing we're, we're told is that they continue to investigate and it's going to be a long time. 
Another question coming through, and this one from Adam Taylor, Heather, on news that came out today of the misidentification, and of course, a lot of tragedy and trauma involved with that. But he wants to know, Adam Taylor, how could they misidentify the victims? How they, can they confirm someone's death and then realize they were wrong? And I hope you were listening to that news conference uh, because some of the answers came out there. They did, and, and by all means, we had to join in on that, as, as you heard it too. I mean, that's the question that everyone was asking. I happened to be on the air this morning when that breaking news came across, and you have to take a deep breath as you're announcing that, because is, that is just an absolutely stunning development in this already heart-wrenching story. And as you said just a few minutes ago, the families on both sides, uh, Xavier LaBelle, um, now alive, for his family who had sent pictures to CBC so that we showed their deceased son as they wanted him to be seen by the country. I mean, extraordinary. And then on the other side, Parker Tobin, whose mother had tweeted out what a difficult time it was. They were so thankful that he was alive, but so sad at the circumstances. And then to learn that he, in fact, is, is one of those deceased. What we learned from that news conference earlier, and Drew Wilby, as he spoke on behalf as the spokesperson, was the only sure way to identify someone is through dental records records with 100% certainty and there wasn't time because the boys came from a number of different provinces and there wasn't time to get that done with 100% certainty but they were assured that they had done all the steps necessary to have those boys identified and they did also say at that news conference that the parents were brought in as part of the identification so that raises all sorts of questions of the, the condition of these boys and under what circumstances did those parents see them uh, but what we also heard it by way of explanation they're young about the same age same physical fitness same stature all had dyed their hair blonde for this playoff run as as teams do and somehow horrifically a mistake was made I, I, that's all I can do is relay the information to you as we, as we learned it but I don't think it'll satisfy people and, and the thoughts to these families as one goes to elation and one is absolutely devastated anew I mean you can't even imagine it thanks for that Heather you are going to continue. You're leaving our program. But Heather is watching for your questions. We are streaming on CBC News Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So that's facebook.com slash CBC News and youtube.com slash CBC News and on Twitter at CBC News. We're back in just a moment. All right, so Suhana, thank you very much. And oh, I did. Oops. I am going to just hello. I'm sorry, I'm just checking in with my questions because um, I'm finished with Suhana and News Network and our simulcast. And so let me talk to you directly. And thank you for joining us here for this Facebook Live on. YouTube and Facebook and on Twitter and my producer back in Toronto Cheryl Brown says that I misspoke during my conversation with Suhanna so I want to clarify this and I'll have Suhanna do so that I said the driver of the bus I meant the driver of the truck of course uninjured and um, and released that is absolutely um, very important to make sure that distinction all right um, Trelly Prince how is the driver now this again is the driver of the truck that crashed the driver of the bus we know uh, he passed away one of those who was killed one of the 15 the driver of the truck he was uninjured as I was mentioning um, astoundingly when you look at those aerial pictures of the crash site so uninjured and as I mentioned he was taken into police custody he was detained for a period of time and then released without charges and released with the help of some mental health professionals um, for the trauma that he must undoubtedly be facing psychologically and that is all that that RCMP have told us to that point so that was earlier in the weekend and we haven't had an update on him since we don't have an identity to the driver of the bus sorry the driver of the truck I've got to get this correct in my head driver of the truck uh, nothing identified to this point 
um, but we'll follow that for you. Okay, so just to be clear, talking about the driver of the truck, John Mercier is wondering in the past how many crashes have happened at that same location. Well, I'm not sure of the exact number, and, and we're continuing to reach that, but people have, have come forward to say there have been more than this one, and uh, the concerns have been similar. Obscured visibility, potentially, the stop signs, um, the, there are no, there is a stop sign. If you look at the video, you can see that there's very clear, sorry, the picture as well. You can see a very clear stop sign. But one of the things that people have been talking about is that there are no rumble strips on the side, uh, the east-west highway. The bus was traveling north on Highway 35. The truck was traveling westward on this smaller highway, 335, on which there are no rumble strips, which would potentially have notified or given some idea of a stop sign and intersection to come. So that's one of the things that they're looking at. They're looking at trees along the property. They're looking at everything, of course, as I mentioned on air, in terms of the investigation. But there have been incidents here and at similar intersections, and some of the uh, regional municipality councillors are now talking already about really taking this on as a project and looking at safety to avoid this uh, complete and utter devastation in the future. So John, thank you for your question. Okay, uh, Peter Schroeder or Schrader in Edmonton, how many of the survivors are still in hospital and we do, we know their condition. Peter, thank you very much uh, for the question. What we know is that only one of the boys has been released from hospital and you saw him last night. Uh, he had some, sh uh, some shoulder injuries. He was able to be at the vigil, but he's the only one who's been released to this point. And the rest are in hospital. And because these are private patient confidentiality issues, uh, we don't know the conditions of the boys or of the trainer. Uh, we know that Dana, the trainer, is also someone who is in hospital. We do know that she's in critical condition. But there were three people taken in critical condition to the hospital initially. One has since died. So, and we haven't had an update. So the last we knew were that two were in critical condition and the conditions of the others uh, not known. So if I think about that and do the correct math, so one in critical condition passed away. Dana, the trainer we know is in critical condition, that was said publicly. So that would seem to indicate at this point one was in critical condition, the conditions of the others have not been specified and again uh, no one is releasing personal in, uh, information. It's really up to the families at this point to say um, what they would like to say. Um, we, we spoke to uh, Straz, Straczynski, um, his mom, Ryan, uh, Michelle, her son Ryan. And we do know because they have chosen to go public that, for example, he was the boy who felt that his back had been injured and he was unable to feel his lower body at the crash site. And we know he broke his back and that he had surgery on Saturday. And the question for him is very much up in the air. What will his future be? Certainly they think he won't skate again. He may well not walk again. These are the questions now facing that family. Uh, but we don't know if there are other families potentially facing those same kinds of dire situations. And the other thing on the, on the situation that we just learned about, Xavier LaBelle, we don't know what his condition is in hospital. He is alive now, we know, but we don't know anything about his personal condition. So again, that's all part of patient confidentiality up to the families to release the details they choose. Peter, thank you very much. Mary Beam Silver asks, how can we donate to the families or help? Oh, well, I tell you what, it's been extraordinary to watch and to, to talk to people as they want to do anything to help. It's really quite moving because the country has responded so beautifully to this horrible time. So let me tell you, there's this GoFundMe page. And if you're comfortable donating to that, is it a verified site? It's all accredited. And that started as a pledge for several hundred thousand dollars. Do you know today it's more than five million? When we were on the air this morning, it was growing by a thousand dollars a minute. It's just this amazing response from Canadians trying to pitch in and help. And that will be money that's going to funeral expenses, frankly. Think of the families that may have to adjust their homes for rehab purposes. You don't know the conditions of the boys when they come home. Um, those kinds of things and as well for the team to rebuild. So there's a GoFundMe page where people in the country are donating so generously. The other thing that I would say though is just to echo the president of the club, um, Kevin Geringer, as he spoke earlier yesterday and again reiterated with me on the air this morning, what they love are the messages of support. So just even sending an email or a text to the team, to the people, anybody's name, Kevin Geringer, 
even strangers, these all mean such a tremendous amount to the people to know that they're not alone in their sadness. So that's a great idea. Suzanne Atkinson, uh, did players from the Nippawan team come to the vigil? Suzanne, they didn't come to this vigil because they had their own vigil last night in Nippawan, which I am told was very emotional as well. What we did see yesterday were really, it was quite amazing, all sorts of teams who did come here. Uh, interesting, in, in Humboldt, all of the teams are called Broncos, and that's from the little, you know, the little midgets all the way up to the junior, mid, uh, the junior Broncos that we're talking about in our coverage. So they're all Broncos and they all had their Broncos jerseys and that was really something. But also neighboring communities had teams and one of the things that was striking was they had some of the teams a little bit lower down. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna remember their actual ranking, but uh, where they are in their level of play, um, they could be called up to play for the Broncos. So they could have been on the bus and they were here and that was really something because one of the players who died was actually somebody who got called up because his team uh, at a lower level was not in the playoffs so there were some of the team members who very well could have been playing and what an honor that would have been for them what a thrill to be playing for the broncos at junior level in the playoffs and they didn't get called up because their team was still in the playoffs at their current level so they were here thinking about that a lot of thoughts about hours on the bus and what it's going to be like for these players when they get on the bus the next time to go to their respective games thank you for that question let me answer um, Marcy Tokar was it the truck driver who had the stop sign or the charter bus uh, Marcy I'm going to tell you I don't want to answer that because I don't want to give information that I'm not hundred percent certain I'm going to think about the picture we do know that it was the truck that t-boned the bus which was to have stopped i'm going to stop right there because i want to make sure i don't um, give you wrong information and uh, implicate something that is is inaccurate so as i said a lot of these things are in flux and will come to light in due course with the rcmp thank you though for the question chantal dupuis when will the media pull out and give them space to grieve Okay, that's a fair point, Chantel. I've had a couple of emails saying let people be private. Um, but you know, I'll tell you something. Nobody here in this community is saying that. Isn't that extraordinary? We have been welcomed with open arms. And people have offered us food. At the hotel where we're staying, we came home at the end of our long night, there was a banquet for us. So many of the out-of-town journalists are there. Uh, they wanted us to be looked after. And, um, what I would say is I've talked to so many people here and I, I've had it's been a privilege but it's been a sad privilege of course I, I have done so many in my career uh, tragedies and I think of Bathurst and I think of St. John's and I think of Moncton and it's always the same you know once they see what you're there for they want their story to be told you know um, of course, they may be a little trepidatious because who are these big city journalists coming in? They don't know our story. They don't know our community. How are you to come into town? I understand that. But I always try to tell them that it's your story. It's not my story. It's not my sadness. It's not my loss. It's your story, and it's yours to tell to the Canadian people. So what I try to do in my coverage always is just be so, is so respectful and appropriate in terms of the tone that I convey and try as much as possible to let the people from the community tell the story. So I'm not foisting my own story. And no one forces them to talk. I can't force anyone to talk to me. They want to come and talk to me. They wanted to talk to me after that vigil. They wanted to, people to know how they felt, how they appreciated the messages of support. And, um, you know, the people who talked about, the people that they lost, like their friends and their billets, you know, that was their choice. They didn't have to come on national television and talk to me about that. I, I, but they wanted to pay tribute. And that's what drew them here. And I am only too happy to do so for the, for the country and to hear those stories and to have them be told honestly from a factual basis and, and uh, appropriately from a tonal standpoint as well. So Chantal, when we leave, we will leave when when perhaps I mean, this was this was a big collective moment for this community and our decisions are sort of do we need to be here 
in such numbers doing entire newscasts? Do we need to be here? We're certainly going to have reporters here who are going to continue to bring you various facets of the story, but do we need to be here with a whole show? Not necessarily. Um, and so we'll evaluate what happens in terms of tomorrow. Tomorrow may likely be back to school, but they may not want us at the school, so maybe, it, maybe it's time for us to come home. It really is a function of the, of the story and its momentum and the developments to come. That was a long answer, Chantel, but I, I think you should know that we've been received so warmly here, and um, we're not trying to impose on anybody. Uh, Judy McCarthy in Newfoundland. What has been the hardest part of all this for you? Listen, Ju listen to me, Judy. Um, I tell you, um, people ask all the time, not just to me. I just did this question. A group of my colleagues at work who aren't journalists asked me this very question. They say, uh, how do you do it without crying? Clearly, I'm not doing a great job here, and I'm not. It's not that I'm crying. I tell you, I, what I'm consciously always aware of is not my sadness. It's not my loss. It's not my tragedy. This is my job to tell the story of these people, and to do it truly, uh, faithfully. And I try so hard to do that. Um, but now that I'm not working for the moment, and I'm looking at this, and I'm talking to you, and you're asking me these questions about these families, then you, I mean. I'm a person too, right? And, and right now I'm not really working, I'm talking to you. And uh, there is a moment when the enormity kicks in and then you think about family, you think about how you would react. I'm from Owen Sound, we have a hockey team that's so important to our community. I live now half the time in London, the London Knights are the lifeblood of our community. I'm from a small town, Ontario. I can, I can feel it. I can feel what it would be like to be part of the community. So I think that sometimes the hardest part is, um, is uh, I mean, I've learned over the years to separate, but it's still in, in, in cases like this, it's hard <laughs> you, because you're a human being too. Hopefully you don't want to be an automaton in these situations. So that's kind of, um, maybe that's a, an answer that helps you understand that, Judy. And thanks for the question, Newfoundland. Parker Tobin has uh, family ties in Newfoundland, and I'm sure the province is really reeling in a totally different way now as a result of today's revelations. William Berry, what was the true time of the accident? It was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, William, 5 p.m. local time as they were heading to Nipawin. Um, Lynn Marie from Montreal, please tell people to sign their organ donor cards. That is one way of helping. Lynn Marie, that is a very important point, and we saw that with one of the boys who um, was kept on life support and until such time as donors, recipients, sorry, not donors, he was a donor, as recipients were found. And as you probably know, um, six people are alive today because of that decision. He signed his donor card the minute he turned 21. And that was obviously something important to him and to his family. And so six of his organs were, were able to, be, we, to save lives. And uh, that will continue on his legacy, and the family is is happy about that. I mean, happy is not the right word, but is drawing some comfort from that. So that is a, a good reminder, and we've done that again. Uh, Preeti Daniels from Saskatchewan heard that someone had witnessed the accident, and she had called 911, that she is at um, RUH, University Hospital, in early labor. Is that correct? Uh, Preeti, I had, what we have, CBC, we have all of the team who's involved in covering the story. We have um, an email chain, and so we send, it's been quite active over these past couple of days, every little detail that uh, we learn, that we want to investigate further, it all goes into a collective email destination. And that is a story that someone did put to the email uh, chain, but we haven't independently confirmed it yet. Um, so I'm not going to tell you anything further about it, but our coverage is it's ongoing. That's probably a storyline that we will be exploring. So what you heard is not, you're not the only person to have t heard that, uh, but I can't give you 100% corroboration on that. And again, if you're just joining us, we're, you're watching a Facebook Live. I'm here in the Elgar Peterson Arena. 
which has been the beacon for this community ever since the tragedy on Friday. And uh, thank you for joining us on Facebook and on YouTube and on Twitter as well. And uh, let me just, uh, before I take your questions, because I think there are still, still some more to go, uh, I'll do, if you haven't seen the scene yet, Richard, my fantastic cameraman, will just give you the view. Um, this is Senator Rice, and just bear in mind, and this is part of the heartbreak of this last night, exactly as the time as we were having a vigil, they were supposed to be dropping the puck at center ice on what might have been game six of their semifinal playoff. So they wanted to keep that center ice and the Broncos logo exposed. But all of those flowers have been donated by people in the community. And there you see, if you move up, Richard, can you move up there? You see, this is one thing that really touches me, the boxes of tissue. Everybody who came in was offered tissue because the tears were flowing and they won't stop. But there are some of the leftover boxes of tissue that were there from, from the night before. On that carpeted area, that was where they had 400 seats set up for family members and other junior hockey players and other teams and people who had come in in the broader hockey family. You see at the front there, all of the big photos of the players, the team coaches, the trainers, the driver, the statistician, the broadcaster, they're all there and remembered. And then the flowers, more tributes as well. But one of the things that I noticed there, of course, is the home bench the Broncos home bench and it's empty and it will be for the foreseeable future although the team is going to carry on but uh, that I find a particularly poignant scene as I look across the ice so that's where we are let me just go back to this just to situate things for you um, let me move back here how do we donate Sorry, just bear with me for just one moment here, and I'll find where I was in the thread. Uh, Amanda Lynn Trebek in Hamilton. How was the truck driver? Is he being provided support? Amanda, we, we spoke about that earlier. Uh, we haven't heard anything about the driver of the truck for a couple of days now, but the last word that we had from police was he had been taken in, uh, detained, released, no charges, and released with mental health supports, and that's really all that we know. Um, his identity has not been released or anything further about his condition. So that is the update that we have on him. Uh, and um, Jane Elizabeth um, from New Brunswick, will the truck driver come forward and state what took place? I don't know how that will go, Jane. Imagine the burden that he will carry for the rest of his days. Um, I'm sure he'll be speaking to police. He'll have to at a certain point, and it will depend. Um, the bus company hasn't said anything at this point. They haven't come forward with any sort of comment. And, uh, sorry, the bus company has talked about the driver. The, the trucking company we haven't heard from to this point. And it'll be hard to know what what will happen. Um, I'm trying to think of similar tragedies, whether, whether the person, I mean, may, these are such tight communities. They're all neighboring communities, they're all neighborly communities. There may be some need to, to speak to this. And to uh, and to express grief and and um, solidarity, but that will be a personal choice, I'm sure, and, and I don't really have the uh, the answer for that. It was Logan Mboulet who was the player. I just want you to know who um, who chose to donate those organs and save the lives of six players. And again, the message to sign donor cards is very clear today. Jan Underhill, are the first responders receiving mental health support? That's an excellent question, Jan, and. Um, as far as we know they are, and they have not yet spoken uh, publicly, and that's totally understandable. Thinking about them a lot, uh, I wondered if they might be at this vigil, but, th but they weren't. It was three, it was Tisdale, and it was uh, Nipawin and another community that I haven't talked about very much, and I'm not, I've forgotten the name of the third community, but they were the three communities responders that were on scene. And, this, and they would have seen things that they would never want to see in a lifetime, and I'm, those images will stay with them. But what we are understanding is, yes, they are indeed receiving psychological support, and they will for the foreseeable future. Uh, but I have no further details on that type of support or what exactly are, they're doing to help them. Um, and no one has come forward to speak and tell their story. They probably will in due time, and certainly they're being heralded by everyone here and everyone to whom I'm speaking as, as the heroes for... for answering that call and responding as heroically as I did. Um, I would also say on that point, you should know this, um, one of the things that has been very obvious here are the people who walk around this arena when it's filled with people from the community. There are 55 people with great big yellow badges that say crisis team.
and they have comfort dogs and therapy dogs who are here just if people need a hug to give a hug to those beautiful dogs and just to feel love and not sadness for a moment and they are really treating the psychological component of this tragedy as a major priority and, and immediately. This is not something that they're going to wait for a bit and then and offer help. They are dealing with this now and they are planning to deal with this from the mental health post-traumatic stress disorder standpoint for a long time to come. And that has been a huge change. There's much more openness to talk about mental health, the impact of these kinds of things, whether on first responders or in the community. Think how many young people affect it. This can linger for a long time. Uh, I have been talking here with Sheldon Kennedy who is of course a former NHLer and has been very um, one of the main voices on this story because he played in Swift Current in 1986 and those Broncos were involved in a fatal bus crash and four of their team members were killed and nobody talked about it at that time and nobody got that kind of psychological help so it was that's 1986. Things have changed a great deal here in 2018, and I see it everywhere around here. The mayor talks about it. The president of the club talks about it. They're all talking about just how important it is to safeguard um, the mental health of their communities. So uh, let me see. Uh, the first responders uh, happen to know how the kids who weren't physically injured are doing. Um, there is no one who was not physically interviewed, Lara, uh, and some to, to very great degrees. So we don't know their conditions, but not a soul on that bus escaped injury. Um, Steve Paris, have they canceled, postponed the playoffs? It's a good question. They, they not as far as the league. Uh, certainly this playoff season, this was the semifinal. Um, it is obviously finished but they are talking about this team continuing next year. Uh, Vardit Feldman on Twitter, thank you very much. Lovely to see the world come to the uh, aid of the families with the GoFundMe fund. Will there be a ceiling on that fund? And if not, what happens to the money after all the families have been well looked after? Well, uh, Vardit, thank you. And uh, this is a good question on which perhaps to end our discussion today because it is a last opportunity for me to tell you about, again, if you're watching from elsewhere in the world, uh, about helping and donating. I don't believe there's a ceiling. They've just continued to, to move the target. It was $4 million just this morning, and then it was already surpassed, and then now it's over $5 million, and as I said, the, the rate of money coming in is, is extraordinary. Um, but what I would say is, in talking to Kevin Garinger, the president of the Humboldt Broncos, they're not going to make these decisions themselves. They're going to talk to people about what is the best use of this money. He's been very clear on that. Yes, they're going to look after the families for whatever expenses to defray. And uh, as I said, I, I can't even begin the list of, of, of things that may have to change in their lives. Certainly funerals first and foremost, but there'll be travel and there could very well be uh, retrofitting their homes and all kinds of things to to adapt to whatever injuries the team members have so those are things for the families and and legacy funds one would imagine for the families for the boys but for the team too this is a community-owned team they want to keep it in the community so I'm sure some of the money will help the team continue but they are going to speak to people to help them manage the money and I think set things up in a way uh, that it will be handled professionally and uh, with a view to the long term so the details of that um, as yet to be announced. They're working with far more immediate concerns right now, but they are, this is also partly on their mind at this, start, at this point anyway, as they start to make a plan. So I'm gonna step out of here one more time, just to give you one last view of the arena where so much emotion has been spent and so much will. The hub, the heart of this community, right here in Humboldt, Saskatchewan. So I'm Heather Hiscox, and you normally see me on Morning Live on CBC News Network. It's been a pleasure to take your questions. Thank you for the interest in this story. It's an important one, and we'll continue to cover it for you on CBC News Network and answer any questions you might have in the weeks and days to come. Thanks a lot.